The following message was given at Grace Community Church in Minden, Nevada. We spent the last few months, two months, I can't remember, on how to read and study the Bible. And we come to our last lesson tonight, uh, today. And so let's pray and then we'll, we'll get on with it. Father, we thank you for the stewardship of our children and we pray that Lord's Day by Lord's Day that you would faithfully implant your word which is able to save their souls. We pray, Father, that, that their homes would be filled with Christ, that they would hear much from mom and dad of the wonders and the mercies of your son. And Father, we thank you today that we get the privilege of seeing so many baptized, and we thank you for this day. We pray that it would be a market day for our souls in Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, we uh, are going to wrap up our um, Sunday school class on this subject on word studies. Next week, Jason's going to start um, the, uh, what's, what's it called, the, the God's book? Big God's Big Picture, which is going to be a, basically an overview of redemptive history. See so yeah, how the Bible fits together in a big picture. But today, we're going to actually go to the opposite end of that. We're going to look at the tiniest thing, and that is words. And of course, words are important. Uh, as we study the Bible, word studies are important. And it doesn't take a, a rocket scientist to figure out that the meaning of words is crucial. Um, but it, actually, it's when we start talking about the meaning of words that we often uh, fail to have any kind of linguistic common sense. And so a lot of times we will approach word studies, and I'm thinking specifically in terms of biblical word studies, and, and either on the one hand over-interpret things, we'll look at some examples of that, or we end up interpreting in a way that ignores the fact that words have contexts. And that we're looking actually not at English words, but at Hebrew and Greek words. And those Hebrew and Greek words have contexts. And not only do they have contexts, but they have stems that may change the meaning of a word. They have tenses and voices and moods, and they fit into grammar and syntax and all of that. In other words, words are never merely isolated things that we pull out and then look at. All right? And so if you're, if you're really, really serious about wanting to be a good student of the Bible, then I just want to recommend that one that you read D.A. Carson's Exegetical Fallacies, which is a classic. And then also, if you're super serious, you can read Moisa Silva's uh, Biblical Words and Their Meaning. Uh, there are some things that you should just on the outset be a little cautious about. For instance, um, some of you may have on your shelves uh, W.E. Vines, an expository dictionary of New Testament words or trenches, synonyms of the New Testament. Those have been around for a very long time. They actually commit many of the fallacies that we're going to talk about today. All right. So when we think about words, we have to think about two main things, and that is that any given word has a range of meaning. Okay. It's what we would simply call the semantic range of, of a word. In other words, there, there is no word that has a single objective inherent meaning. All right? Can you think of one English word that only means one thing and one thing only whenever it's used? No. <laughs> That's close, but there is, there is no word, because no doesn't always mean no. Right? There, what? First person singular pronoun I. Okay. Um, yeah, well, 
you're, you're kind of missing the point here. Okay. Think of a word that's not a pronoun. Okay. All right. So, I mean, you can take any, uh, you can take multiple examples. Um, think of the word book. I mean, how many meanings does the word book have? You go book. Okay. Well, the inherent meaning of the word book is, is something that has pages and a spine. Well, not so if you happen to be at a police station and it's being used as a verb, right? Um, I was uh, sitting at my study yesterday and I just looked, I said, okay, what, what word can we use? Book. Well, how many words, how many ways can you use the word book, right? Um, think about kick. Uh, I mean, there, there are so many different things. The thing about roller coaster. Well, there's one that's got to be mean one thing, right? Well, no, not really. Uh, uh, sure, a ride at California Screaming, but what about um, uh, our marriage has been a roller coaster, right? I mean, so the, the, the idea that, that words somehow are these, are these little independent things that only have a uh, single inherent meaning... You have to get rid of that idea. Any word has, think of a word not as having a single meaning, but having a range of meaning that fits into a larger circle of possibilities. All right. The second main thing that you have to remember is that it is ultimately context that determines meaning. All right. Context determines meaning. Any given word may only have a, a, a possible range of meanings, but it is the context that will actually give that word its sense of meaning. So if, um, if I say Jason got booked last night, um, that could mean one of two things. Maybe he is an outstanding violin virtuoso and he got a uh, a, a gig at the, uh, you know, Reno Event Center or something. Uh, he got booked, or it could mean that maybe he was taken to jail and got booked, right? I mean, so you, you have to understand that context is what determines meaning, and that is absolutely true when it comes to the Bible. Sometimes we kind of think of the Bible as having somewhat like magical words, okay? And it's not true. The Bible comes to us, of course, in Hebrew and Greek, but the, the, the Hebrew was the common Hebrew of the day and the Greek was the common Greek of the day. There was no such thing as Holy Ghost Hebrew or Holy Ghost Greek. It was just ordinary language. In fact, Koine Greek is just the is marketplace Greek, ordinary language, right? And so as we think about words, we have to keep that in mind. Semantic range, context determines meaning. So what are some certain things that we want to avoid when we're going to do a word study? And I'm, uh, some of these categories you will be um, probably puzzled by. But what to avoid? The root fallacy. How many of you have ever heard in a sermon the, the preacher say something like, well, the root of this word means X, Y, Z. Right, the, the 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 fallacy is that a word, the a word's meaning is tied up in its component parts, or um, or or even its etymology, which is the history of that word word's meaning. George Guthrie says he says now the root fallacy means that I'm going to base my understanding of the word on the Greek or Hebrew word, root of the word. Now this is when a person gets into doing word studies and they learn just enough to be dangerous. Okay. One of the reasons why the root fallacy is a fallacy is because nobody uses words like this. Okay. So, for instance, what is, what is the root of the word nice? What is the original meaning? You ever, sometimes you hear that. The original meaning of this word is. Uh, what is the original meaning of the word nice? It's ignorant. That's right. So, if I say, nice shirt, is there sort of like, uh, you know, some sort of ulterior meaning here that I'm trying to convey to Jason? And the answer is, how many of you actually use the word nice with the idea of what it originally meant? Okay, nobody does that. Nobody looks at the, the component parts of a word and then deduces the meaning. I mean, what would a pineapple be? 
What's the root meaning of pineapple? Well, it's made up of pine and apple. Did you guys get enough coffee this morning or what? Okay. Well, pineapple has nothing to do with pine or apple, right? It, we could go on and on and do this all, all morning, actually, because there are so many. Um, butterfly. What's the root meaning of butterfly? Well, it's made up of two compound words, meaning butter and fly. You see what I'm getting at, right? And so what the word means at the time that it's used is what's important, not some sort of root meaning of of the word, all right? Uh, A second thing to avoid in doing word studies is what's called uh, semantic anachronism or we're, we could call this just uh, the time frame fallacy, and that is when a later use of a word is read back into an earlier use, all right? Now, by the way, preachers do this all the time, too. So uh, an example would be this. Romans 1.16, the gospel is the dunamis of God unto salvation to all who believe. And, of course, we get our English word dynamite, from dunamis, therefore, right, the gospel is the dynamite of God. It just like blows things up and destroys things, right? <laughs> is, is, is it right to say the gospel is the dynamite of God? And the answer is no. You're taking a later meaning derived from an earlier meaning, reading the later meaning back into an earlier meaning, and that's how nobody uses words, right? We hear this all the time, by the way. So we would be, we take basically a 20th or 21st century derivative idea, and then we read it back in. So second um uh, Second Corinthians nine seven, the word God loves a cheerful giver, and the word hilarion, and so you know what that sounds like, and we get the word hilarious, and so God loves givers who are belly laughing on the floor, right? God loves a hilarious giver, right? Well, no, that's not how words work, all right? So that's what we would call a semantic anachronism, reading a later uh, meaning of a word back into an earlier. There's also, it, it works in the opposite direction, semantic obsolescence. That's when the interpreter assigns a meaning to a word that it had in earlier times, but no longer uh, is within the semantic range when the word is being used. Probably the best way to um, illustrate this is with, um, with, with English, all right? Um, d- d- take the word gay, all right? Now, if you took this word 40 years ago, would, would people have immediately associated it with homosexual? Not at all. What, what, what would gay mean? Happy, okay? Um, How wise do you think it is to go up to somebody today and say, you look so gay today? And they look at you and you say, well, I'm using that in its original (laughs) sense, right? And by the way, there, there are lots of words that this happens to. And what ends up happening, this is, this is just simply the way that language works. That, that, that usage, predominant usage, ends up then determining the meaning of, of that word so that older meanings begin to pass out of usage. And as those older meanings pass out of usage, guess what? Those older meanings become irrelevant to how the word is used now. All right? And so we often do that with um, certain passages in the Bible. Uh, probably one of the... Um, one of the most egregious examples would be in 1 Timothy 2.12, and um, where Paul says, I don't, uh, uh, I don't allow a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. And that word, authenteo, is exercise authority, 
Well, the thing is, is that it's only used once in the New Testament. And, and so people that don't like what that verse says go back to a 5th century B.C. meaning of that word to try to say that Paul's not actually talking about women exercising authority. He's talking about something else. Well, the problem is, again, that's not how words work. It's not how we use language. Uh, another uh, fallacy would be to appeal to an unknown or an unlikely meaning. Okay, so for instance, and this is this is in the same um, the same uh, uh, idea here, and that is so. For instance, Paul says in First Corinthians chapter eleven that the man is the head of the woman, just as God is the head of Christ. All right. Now, those who are what we would call egalitarian, that is, they don't believe in uh, male headship, female submission, etc., uh, this passage has often been a, a, a real stumbling block. And so, um, for instance, the Bilzekians, who wrote a book back in the 80s, um, arguing against this position, deal with this passage and say, well, the, what the word means is source, all right? So the, 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 the Greek word kephale, they argue means source. Well, the problem is, is that there is no evidence in biblical Greek, Septuagint Greek, and extra biblical Greek of kephale meaning source. Okay. Now we might say, now here's, here's part of the, the, the way the fallacies happen. We might think to ourselves, well, head, well, we can talk about the head of a river. So like the source of a river. Okay, but if the word in Greek is never used that way to try to appeal to that meaning is a fallacy. All right. So appealing to unlikely or um, unknown meanings. Um, I would also throw in false assumptions about, quote, technical meanings. Okay, technical meanings, the technical meaning of this word. Are there going to be words that may may have more of um, um a technical use at times. So think of the word accounting. Okay? When we use the word accounting, most of the time, not always, but most of the time or much of the time, that's going to be used within a certain kind of context, right? Okay? So we could say that there are certain technical aspects to a word, right? But the idea of a technical meaning or sometimes called the real meaning is really Another fallacy. And so here the interpreter falsely assumes that a word always or nearly always has a technical meaning. Or that there is some sort of um, uh, like theological meaning of a word, the, the i.e. the real meaning. So let me just give you an example. Um, and you've heard this before, but never from me. Agape. Okay. Agape. Now the real meaning of agape is an unconditional God kind of love, right? Amen. <laughs> Suckers. Okay. Yeah. So in the Septuagint, it actually says that Amon loved Tamar before he raped her. And the word love is the verb for agape. Okay. Um, Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me. Agape. Verb form of agape. Okay. Now, it's really hard to try to insist on some sort of um, real meaning, some sort of technical meaning for agape, when it's used in contexts in which the idea of unconditional God kind of love is absolutely unfathomable, right? What is it that makes agape a special word? It's use. It's use. It's context, right? It's context. By the way, a lot of times we uh, try to make a distinction between, uh, let's say, uh, agapao and phileo, or uh, agape and, and, and philos, right? 
And so we say, and, and by the way, some of this probably comes from C.S. Lewis um, and uh, other people that have written on biblical words for love. And so the idea that agape is somehow um, uh, this unconditional God kind of love and, and philos is uh, sort of like the uh, friendship, right? I like you a lot kind of thing. You have certain qualities that attract me. And the fact is, is that you read through the Gospel of John, and do you know what you see? Agapao and Phileo actually used interchangeably between the Father and the Son. Okay. So does that mean sometimes God has the God kind of love for the Son, and then other times he just really likes him a lot? No. Actually, the idea is context, usage, right? By the way, not to... Uh, and I've preached on this before, so it shouldn't necessarily um, bug you too bad. It's just a word about synonyms. Sometimes what we do is we look at the, the Bible, we use synonyms, and then what we try to do is we try to get some sort of nuanced meaning from each word as if it is saying two different things. Okay? The classic example is when Jesus is restoring Peter at the Sea of Galilee. In, in John chapter 21. And so th this, by the way, come, is this was started by Trench's uh, synonyms. The idea is, uh, Peter, do you love me, agapao, more than these? Lord, you know I phileo you. Okay? Peter, do you love me more than these? Lord, you know I phileo you. Peter, do you phileo me? You know, Lord, I phileo you. And then Peter was grieved. And so what basically the idea is, is that, um, well, look at that. There's two different words used. And there's obviously a meaning, a reason why two different words are used. And so the sermons go on endlessly, something like this. Jesus says, Peter, do you love me with the unconditional God kind of love? And Peter says, Lord, you know, I like you a lot. Peter, do you love me with the unconditional God kind of love? Lord, you know, I like you a lot. Peter, do you like me a lot? Lord, you know I like you a lot, right? And that's how the sermon is preached. The fact is, is that it's just a stylistic variation. Jesus is asking Peter the same question three times, okay? He's not asking him two different questions. What in the world would make me think that the, the stylistic variation, well, you can, you know, you can listen to the sermon if you want. It was a while ago, but... You know what else Jesus says in that passage? Feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. Is he making a fundamental distinction between lambs and sheep? Or is he just saying, feed my people and using... By the way, if, if you ever write anything, you know that you can use different words and mean the same thing, right? In fact... A good English teacher will knock you down a few grades if you just continually use the same word over and over and over again, all right? So the idea that somehow these words have a technical meaning, that these have a real meaning, and therefore, the, the fact is, is that a lot of times we just have synonymous overlap in the way that we use words, all right? Uh, even important words, by the way, need a context. When you see the word justify, does it always mean God imputing the act of obedience to Christ to your account and forgiving your sins? I mean, justify is an important word, right? Who would doubt justify is an important word? But does it always mean the same thing? And the answer is no. In fact, the Pharisees, what was it, Luke, um, Luke 16, the Pharisees who were trying to justify themselves, okay? they weren't trying to impute Christ's righteousness to themselves, right, and get the pardon for their sin. So even important words, what about the word sanctify? Does the word sanctify always mean exactly the same thing? What do you think? Sanctify. I mean, that's a holy word. That's a special word. Sanctify. Does it always mean the work of the Spirit in progressively conforming us to the image of Christ? And the answer is no. In fact, a believing wife is said to sanctify an unbelieving husband. Well, it certainly doesn't mean a 
special operation of the Holy Spirit in which he's conformed more to the image of Christ. Okay? So we need to remember, we have to, we have to be careful that we're not making false assumptions about technical meanings of words, the real, quote, real meaning of a word. The real meaning of a word is what it means in its context. There's the real meaning, all right? Uh, the next is my favorite. This is uh, Don Carson's language, not mine. Illegitimately to, uh, illegitimate totality transfer. Jason does it all the time. I'm trying to break him of it. Um, sometimes it's called the overload fallacy, and that is the fallacy, the idea of a, the meaning of a word in a specific context is actually much broader than you could well imagine. And so what they do in, in, in this approach is they, they see the semantic range of a word. Let's say, let's say that there are like eight to ten possibilities uh, within a semantic range. And then they get to, to get to this word in its context. And then what it means is actually all of those things. Okay. So, by the way, there's a Bible translation that is devoted to this fallacy. Anybody know? The Amplified, or as Diane Gamble used to call it, the Loud Bible. Um, yeah, the Amplified. So what, what's happening is, is that when you're looking and, and you, 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 you say a word means five or six things, it's just not true. Now, are there, are there um, what we might call double entendres? And the answer is yes. Could it be that, uh, that, that, that the style of writing is using a rhetorical device called double entendre in which two things are perhaps inferred? And the answer is yes. And we have a biblical writer who is profoundly fond of these, which is the Gospel of John in particular, where John actually uses these double entendres. But that doesn't mean that every time you see a word, you say it means this, 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 and this. All right? Okay. Uh, let me just do one more. The word count fallacy. You know what this fallacy is, right? The word count fallacy. You see a word and you, thought, you see four different places that it's used. And it means this in those four different places. And therefore, it must mean this in this place. Okay? Is that true? Could you use one word within one paragraph twice and mean two different things? Absolutely. And in fact, would the people who are, let's say, native speakers who are reading, would they pick up what you're doing? In fact, they may not even notice that you just use the same word twice, right? <laughs> okay. So the idea of just word counts and, um, and, and in fact, um, now let, let's say, let's say Paul uses a particular word 12 times. All right. And in those 12 contexts, it all means the same thing. And you get to the 13th. Is there a likelihood that Paul is using it in a way that he consistently uses it in other places? Well, the answer is that depends. Is the word just sort of a generic word? Or does, the, does Paul seem to actually kind of use this word in a specific way? Then that might lead me on the 13th to think, okay, uh, there's a good possibility that, that this is how he's using the word here. But even then, that is not the ultimate um, determining factor. All right? Okay. Well, don't commit any of those fallacies, please. All right. Simple and proper word study procedures. Preliminary considerations. I have 12 minutes. Actually, I go by this watch. I have 14 minutes. Okay, so the first thing is, if you're going to do a word study in the Bible, uh, just understand, one, that lexical studies, that is the study of words, can actually be complex. Just understand that, that, that there, may be, there, there may be a word that's used in the New Testament that has a background in Septuagint Greek. Okay? Um, the, you have to understand that, that lexical studies can, in fact, be uh, complex. Um, uh, second, understand that if you're using your English Bible, there will be some limitations. Let's say you're studying the book of Ecclesiastes, and your Bible translation says vanity of vanities, and so you look up in the Oxford English Dictionary the word vanity, and then you look at all the places where vanity is used in Ecclesiastes, and guess what? You, you, you actually are headed down the wrong path. You know why? 
because the word for vanity comes from the Hebrew word, you guys know this, right? Havel. And do you think that Havel is always going to be translated the same way throughout the book of Ecclesiastes? Not at all. So guess what you've done? All of a sudden you've limited the, uh, the uh, actual number of uses. So you're going to come up short in a sense. But also you're relying on a translation at that point for a particular word and then trying to derive its meaning from that English meaning. Okay? And so I would say that if, if we're using English Bible, there's going to be some limitations. And then understand if you're trying to use the original language and you don't know the original language, there's also going to be limitation. And one of the reasons, so, so let's say I, I stood up here and, um, and let, let's say I um, had read Calvin's Institutes in French. Now, that's impossible. Do you know Why? Because I don't know French, okay? You know, you know what they call people that speak three languages, right? <laughs> they, they call them trilingual. You know what they call people who speak two languages? Bilingual. You know what they call people that speak one language? American, American that's right. So, um, so if I say, well, I was reading the Institutes in, in French, you'd say, okay, well... What were you doing? And I said, well, I found this thing called Google Translate. Okay. And I was putting in the French into Google Translate. First of all, am I reading the Institutes? <laughs> no, I'm not reading the Institutes. Okay. Um, I'm just not. That's, not. that's not reading at all. Uh, but then let's say I, I, I told you that in book one, chapter one, I found this awesome use of this French word. Okay. And it means X, Y, and Z. Okay. But I don't know how the word functions in its context. I don't know how the word functions in its, in, in, in its grammatical structure. I just found a French word that sounds really neat. Right. How much stock are you going to put in my Discovery. Zero. Thank you. You could have at least given me a little credit. But uh, yeah, absolutely zero. You're not going to put any stock in at all because um, I'm, I'm doing the very thing that is very contrary to the way that words work. And that is I'm trying to isolate a word that I don't even know how it functions overall. So I have to be careful. All right. I have to be careful. Um, so basic procedures. Uh, we'll do this in eight minutes or so. So know which words you're going to spend time on. All right. Do you have to do, if you're going to do word study, do you have to do a word study on every single word in the verse? No. How do you know? I mean, how are you going to pick what words to spend time on? Help me out here. Okay. How important are they for the thought? Okay. Okay. Might I spend more time on verbs than, let's say, adjectives? Usually. Usually. Right? Right? Can I tell you why? Sure, because an adjective is simply modifying another noun or another adjective, and all it's doing is adding some sort of detail that may be important, but the adjective itself is probably not going to have a whole lot of weight other than being some sort of descriptive word. The verb itself is, is <laughs> I just thought of this, the verb is where the action is, right? Now, <laughs> um, so typically you're going to be, you're going to spend a little more thought um, in choosing the verbs that you use than let's say the adverbs um, or the adjectives, all right? Um, so... Picking important words that are in, in the sentence, you can tell that that's the, the sentence or this verse hang, really kind of hangs on the meaning of this word, right? So important words like that. What other words might we want to spend some time with? Yes, repeated words. Absolutely. Why? Why would we want to do that? Yeah. 
Um, in fact, I think a, a few lessons ago, I said, pay attention to repeated words. People will repeat words on, on purpose, right? For a reason, okay? Um, other words we might want to take a look at? The world turns on prepositions, it's true. But you can actually figure out any preposition understanding just the basic block of Swiss cheese. Yes, somebody had their hand up. Other words, Phil. Yeah, I'm going to pay attention to tense, but as far as word study goes, I'm, I'm going to want to know what the, what the, if it's a verb, what the tense is. Um, but I want to be careful there, too. I don't want to overload the tense. Okay. Okay, maybe difficult words, words that don't have a clear meaning to me. Okay. All right, sure. All of these are absolutely true. Make sure you pay attention, too, to words that might be in phrases. So, for instance, you come across the book of life. Okay? So, at that point, you're not just looking at a word. You're looking at a word within a phrase. Okay? Okay, so if you pick out the words that you're going to spend some time with. And then I would suggest next is to compare translations. See how different translations translate these words. And I would use that span of translations from functional equivalents to or formal equivalents to functional or dynamic equivalents. So in other words, I'm, I'm going to be looking at the NAS. I'm going to be looking at the ESV. And I'll probably want to take a look at uh, even the NIV and the Christian Standard Bible. I want, to have a, I want to have a range so that I can kind of see how they do this, right? And then I'm going to do my best to find that word in the original, Okay. Okay, so let's, let's, um, let's expedite our case study here. We're going to use Ephesians 4.29. Somebody give me the first part of Ephesians 4.29. Okay, so that's good. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. Okay? Do you think um, proceed from your mouth? You're going to need to spend some time studying that, or is that fairly clear what that means? Yeah, it's clear. If you're spending all your time on proceed from your mouth, you're wasting your time, okay? Because words are proceed. So what, what word do we want to actually spend time on? Unwholesome, exactly. We want to spend time on unwholesome. And so, um, by the way, so if you, uh, the way that it is in, in the Greek text is no word of unwholesomeness, okay? And so let's say you find out that this particular word in the New Testament is, is sopros, okay? Sopros. You say, okay, so you get that down, and so you find the original word, sopros. Now, the next thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to see where that word is used in other places in the New Testament, all right? And so you're going to look for other uses of the word. Now, here's the important part, is that you want to note the context. Sometimes the context helps us narrow the possibility of meaning with a word. So, for instance, Ephesians 4.29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth except that which is Good for edification. So what can we tell about the word sapros in the immediate context? That is, it is opposite of good for edification, right? So whatever sapros means, it seems to be in antithesis to good for edification, all right. That, so, so we pay attention because a lot of times the context can actually narrow that range down for us. So we want to remember, this is George Guthrie, by the way. He's got a wonderful website. He's a very good New Testament scholar. He says, remember to look very carefully at the context of the passage. Which possible meaning makes most sense? All right. So you've, you've looked at sapros. You've seen that it's used in a number of different ways. Um, actually, n not so in the New Testament, only a couple different ways. And so in this particular passage you're studying, a word is normally going to carry the idea of one primary meaning. And so the Greek or Hebrew study tool that you're using will have a number of possibilities. And again, your job is to do what? Figure out the one that best fits the context. Okay. 
Now, then you're going to consult a standard lexicon or a commentary or a, a theological dictionary and so forth. And so, so here we have our Ephesians 4.29s. New American Standard, NIV, and Net Bible say unwholesome word. Okay? ESV, you know what the ESV says? Corrupting talk. Okay? Unwholesome word, corrupting talk. Christian Standard Bible says foul language. Okay? Foul language. New Living Translation, which is in fact a translation and is often very helpful, says foul or abusive language. You know what they're doing at that point? They're kind of actually spreading the range for us a little bit. Okay? Uh, New Revised Standard Version, evil talk. Okay? Evil talk. So we look this word up, saw process, and we find out that it's used eight times in the New Testament. So it's eight times a pretty good number. It's better than one. Okay? When you have a word that's only used one time in the New Testament, you have an inherent challenge. And that is you don't have any comparative context to look at. The only context you have is the context that the word is in. That's all. And so it is very, it's very challenging. So eight isn't bad. And, uh, and guess where this is used? So uh, Matthew 7, 17, and 18, it's used a few different times. About good trees producing good fruit and bad trees. Sopros trees producing sopros fruit. It's interesting, right? Then it's used in Matthew twelve thirty three, and it's a um, uh, uh, parallel passage in Luke six forty three in the same way. And then it's used in Matthew thirteen forty eight with um, Jesus telling a parable, and he talks about hauling in these fish. Right. So, by the way, they're they're just newly caught, but they are sapros fish. Okay. So, so track with me here. So we have bad fruit, sapros fruit that comes from bad trees. And we have fish that are caught. So the, the, what, what are we doing? We're seeing how the word is used so that we get this idea of, 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 of a possible range of meaning. And this, is, this, this actually is going to help us. So what we know from the context is that it's contrary to words that are good for edification. And, and so whatever it means, it's got to be in opposition to that. And then we see this is used of bad fruit, which how might we describe that kind of fruit that Jesus is talking about? No, let's think about fruit. Bruised. What's that? Persimmons. <laughs> Rotten fruit. Okay? Rotten fruit. So let's say you're noticing, okay, uh, now, by the way, rotten fruit. That, understand that what you may end up having is you may end up having. Uh, it, when it comes to sapros fruit, you may end up having fruit that is useless, okay? So maybe it's not ripe, or maybe it's rotten, okay, in the sense that it's, it's, it's actually, you know, corrupted at this point, right? Ruined. Um, what about the fish passage? So the fish passage, it can't be rotten fish because he just took them out of the net. Okay. No. If you are in the business for a, in the fish market and you're pulling fish in and you have sapros fish, this is fish that is unusable. Okay? You can't sell it. Right? So now, so what does the word mean in Ephesians 4.29? It means don't use any words that you can't sell in market. Right? No, not necessarily. Right? And so then we, let's say, we have access and we go to Bauer, Art, and Gingrich, and we see that the word sapros means of such poor quality to be of little or no value. Bad is in not good. 
And then there, they give a number of examples. And so it's spoiled or rotten, sometimes it's spoiled fish or rotten fruit or worms that infect olives or grapes um, or just of bad quality. And then it actually cites the Matthew 13, 48 passage. The, 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 the fish, that are they're not rotten or spoiled, but they are inferior quality, right? Uh, and then there's another entry that means bad or unwholesome to the extent of being harmful, And then there's a number of examples there, and then they actually have our passage listed, which is the idea of bad, evil, or unwholesome, okay? So what kind of conclusions can you start to make about this word unwholesome? Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, except that which is good for edification. Paul. Unedifying, all right. Then you go back and you look at your translations. Unwholesome. What is unwholesome? We don't, actually, we don't really use that very much anymore, do we? Yeah, yeah, it's like there's gluten in those words. Okay, all right. What's actually most helpful in light of the examples we have? Corrupting. Corrupting. Why is that probably the best example? Because it's contrary to edification. Edification is building up. And and unwholesome doesn't quite get that contrast, does it? But corrupting does, right? And corrupting also kind of conveys something about the way the word is typically used, okay? Now, it could be, um, let's say, idle words or uh, uh, unuseful words, but it seems to be a little more strong than that in the context, right? Okay. And so there are, there are sane ways to read our Bibles and determine the meaning of words, all right? Okay, I'm way over time. Any questions, comments, protests, riots, demonstrations, outbursts, letters to the editor, unwholesome words? All right, got to do this fast. Don. <laughs> it's irrelevant. Paul. Well, it's, it's not that it's particularly tough, but what happens is the, uh, the, your, your more um, dynamic equivalent translations interpret what they think that we, uh, Paul meant by corrupting speech. Foul or abusive language, right? That may or may not be the case, Correct. That may, that, that may in, include what Paul was talking about. So it's, that comes down to a difference in translational philosophy is what you do with the word then. Okay. Jeff. Um, George Guthrie's website might be, um, I don't know, georgeguthrie.com, I don't know. Um, he teaches, he just moved... Um, but you, if you put George Guthrie blog or something, you'll, you'll find it. Um, what's the best translation to give to somebody that, for them to read? Um, well, no, I would not say the King James. I would actually say that that would be a mistake. Um, I mean, well, I, I mean, I, what I want to do is I want to help them uh, read and understand, Right? So, I mean, I think that the ESV is probably, I think it's a good compromise. At times, the New American Standard, especially in the Old Testament, is a little, um, is a little wooden. Uh, even the updated edition from 95 doesn't, um, in other words, they're so committed to trying to replicate um, grammar and syntax that a lot of times they could do better. And then, of course, there are times where they... You know, it's the one I use and it's my favorite. But I think the ESV is probably, because what you have is a translation that went for readability, but also formal equivalence in translation. And, and, I, and, and I'm going to just gravitate towards that. Now, let's say you got, you know, an eight-year-old, you know, I might give him the Christian Standard Bible. I love the Christian Standard Bible. It's, it's easy to read. It's, it's, uh, it's typically very accurate and sometimes... Pretty fresh. All right. Okay. We hope that you were edified by this message. 
For additional sermons, as well as information on giving to the ministry of Grace Community Church, please visit us online at gracenevada.com. That's gracenevada.com.